Hello. Uh, we're here for office hours, and I'm here with Graham Chamnis, who is a doctoral student here at Harvard, uh, who works in early medieval Chinese literature. You work with Professor Chen Xiaofei. That's right. And uh, what kind of work do you do or anticipate doing? I'm looking right now at fourth and fifth century intellectual communities and the networks of, between Buddhists and Taoists in early medieval China. Terrific. We're going to talk about your reaction uh, to the Yinging story. Um, and, you know, there isn't a story that really has a longer afterlife, it seems to me, as a love story in, in Chinese literature. Uh, and so the question we have on your poll, the question is, what is this story about? And 43% of you said it was about love. 25% said it was only about infatuation. 22% said, ultimately, this is a story about morality. 7% and I'm kind of surprised it's only 7% said it's about power, 2% about politics, and only 1% about family. Uh, so, Graham, what do you think this story is about? Um, I actually think I want to agree with the majority. A part of me wants to agree with the majority and say this is about love. I also think it's about public display of passion. A public display that's uncommon for its time. Because I think uh, Zhang is clearly uncomfortable with... Uh, displaying himself and, and being at ease with his own passions for yin yin. And that plays out throughout the story. Okay. Well, another question that we asked was, what kind of girl is yin yin? What kind of girl is Madame Sui's daughter? Uh, why does she hesitate to meet with Zhang and then refuse to answer him? And you wrote a number of, I think, quite astute but quite different responses. Self-obsessed. Sensitive, young, shy, coy, independent, rebellious, immature, educated, attractive, insecure, and free-spirited. Jasmine Lai writes, and she's a woman of principle. Really quite different. Uh, she dares to love and dares to hate. Um, this is Bai Feng. She is modest and chaste, but more to the point, doesn't like being bossed around by her mom. Fairly typical teenage behavior. She may also be wary, worried about being tricked or misused by this powerful relative. And Alexander Martin tries to summarize what a number of people have written here. It says, she is uncomfortable with the situation, or she's rebellious, or she's a bit of a brat, or D, her mother is scheming, and it is deliberate. So Graham, what's your, what's your take? Um, I actually liked the responses that caught Ying Ying's uh, coyness. And this was, I remember this assessment was put at the part where she refuses to come out and greet Zhang or right, answer his right, questions. Right, right. And yeah, I saw, I think she was uh, playing hard to get. Okay. All right. All right. That's what I recall when we did this with our undergraduates as well, the kind of among the men, the view that she was playing hard to get was overwhelmingly the Maybe the, it's a the familiar it may be a, <laughs> Maybe. A, okay. Now... If we look into some of the other questions, it's hard to believe that the story could resonate through so many s centuries. Uh, if it's simply a matter of a dichotomy between ritual and passion, why, why do you think we're still reading it today? Um, I really think the, the key is in the ending of the story. This story goes on and uh, comes into many other forms throughout Chinese literary history. And it's given a happy ending. So in, in the in the Tong's version, uh, Zhang meets meets Ying Ying, and they have an unsuccessful, uh, passionate encounter. Zhang goes to take the examinations and fails, and feels embarrassed by this, humiliated. Um, and then there's a, a clear rejection. Ying Ying sends this this letter to Zhang. Zhang receives it, and the two never see each other again. Um, and I think people are uncomfortable with that ending. They want to know why uh, why things ended sourly, who dumped who, um, or even questions like who seduces who. And I think you can see this discomfort in the different uh, endings that are given to the story throughout Chinese literary history. It's interesting. I wonder what ending people in contemporary China would imagine, kind of the distance between a gentleman on his way to be an official and someone who is, to be sure, from an elite family, but nevertheless 
the distance is about to grow, assuming that he passes the examination. Yeah, no, and I think that's a crucial point in the text. Uh, and Zhang is successful in the later version, passing the examination. So, so everything, it's really an inversion of the story. Really, it sounds like a, a kind of an American sitcom that, ending. So one of you asks, why is marriage between Ying and Zhang so out of the question? Uh, is it because of his duty to the state uh, and the distraction of lust to his duty for the state? Is it possible that they could have had a more passionless uh, marriage? And is the marriage really out of the question from your point of view? Well, I think, if, again, if we look at the text and what's happening, Zhang, in the, in the beginning of the story, he portrays himself um, as a zhen hao se zhe, one truly, uh, like a, a true lover. And this is in contrast to the yeah. typical um, image of a, a dong tu zi, who is uh, an image of sort of a lustful, um, a lustful person in traditional Chinese literature. And, and Zhang is not one of them. But I think he lets himself be, um, he lets himself be drawn to Ying Ying. He lets himself live this life of passion. And then he sees its effects on his failure of the examination. So he needs to repudiate that in order to, to justify his name. Um, and also the reason I think that the public display of passion in this story is important, when Zhang shows the letter to his friends, what he's doing is he's sort of making a case for himself and rectifying his name. Um, so to answer this question, I would say that uh, it's unfortunate that marriage in, in the end was impossible, um, but in the way that the events played out, uh, Zhang wasn't able to. He's not able to do it, but it's not inconceivable that these two individuals, given their social background, could have married. Well, I think we're, not, he, we're not talking a Romeo and Juliet story here. Uh, no, no. In fact, we no. see when they ask about uh, family connections, um, he's a Zhang, she's a Cui, everything's good. Uh, but I think in the end, the way it manifested, it just didn't work out. Right. But again, these are the questions that I think keep the story interesting for Yeah, ab absolutely. And they're <laughs> questions that probably every family who has someone, daughter today, daughter or son, about to take the examinations, the question of diversion uh, in love at, at an even younger age uh, sure. today when one takes the gao cow sure. in China <laughs> uh, is, is something that probably every Chinese parent can understand. Um, if we look at a central question that we always ask our students uh, when we teach the Yingying Ying story, who is seduced by whom? 38% of you think Yingying Ying is seduced by Zhang, 30% think Zhang seduced Yingying, Ying, and 32% of you think neither seduced uh, the other. And this is very, and I think this is probably within the realm of error. If this were in Florida, we would do a recount. Um, uh, here. So, and some of some of the responses uh, are uh, are very very interesting. So, Jasmine Nye once again writes: seventeen-year-old Yingying, presumably never stepped out of her bedroom, versus this twenty-three-year-old John, who has seen it all through his friends. This jaded twenty-three-year-old, uh, she thinks there's simply no match. So she clearly thinks that John is it. Uh, whereas uh, Maggie uh, Homda uh, says that Yingying seduced John right from the beginning under pretext of summoning him so as to scold, uh, but waiting in the moonlight, door half open, and so on. Absolutely, it's yin yin. Paul H.C. writes, and this is a really n more nuanced view, seduction isn't making someone do what they don't want to do. Seduction is enticing someone into doing what they secretly want to do already. And I believe this is what Zhang did, you could also say yin yin in my view, by initiating uh, this situation. So, so Graham, where do you where do you fall on oh, this complicated know. poll? I don't know. I think it's clear we haven't made up our minds, so we have to keep reading. Okay. <laughs> One last uh, comment on that. It's really puppy love. Two youngsters totally and madly in love. Uh, a love that later on, when life kicks in, is unrealistic and just not possible. Uh, well, okay. Now. Do you really <coughs> believe that Ying Ying only wrote her frivolous and coy verses to scold Zhang in person? And here, I think the evidence is pretty clear. Only 22% of you believe, say yes in this, and 78% of you uh, say no. 
Uh, and uh, I think the no's have it, and we'll just leave that. It's um, interesting, too, the discrepancy between that poll and then yeah. the one we just read about Yingying being the seducer. So what was Yingying doing then? If it, we if yeah. we seem to agree that she wasn't just interested in scolding Zhang, she was drawing him to her bedroom. Right. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think deep down 78% of you think that Yingying uh, uh, is the seducer in this. Uh, but when we gave you a choice, and again, there's a huge gender discrepancy in the answers to these <laughs> questions. Okay, finally, going back to this question, which ending do you prefer? The original Tang ending or the happier ending of the Western Chamber, the story of the Western Chamber? Uh, only 16% of you prefer a happy ending. The rest of you are much more realistic about life. 84% of you prefer the original Tang ending. And Graham, is that true of you too? I think that's true. I think when we read the happy ending, uh, you can put the either the book down or, or leave the performance and go on about your life without thinking about it. But this this ending that we're given by Yuan Zhen uh, leaves you constantly wondering why, and asking these questions. Um, and I also think it's much more realistic. Well. It's a pleasure to get the perspective of a leading scholar of the next generation of Chinese <laughs> literature. Uh, and so, Graham, thank you very much for joining us for this week's Office Hours. No, thank you. Thank you.